Yeah, hello everybody. I am um, happy to be part of this um, pain and COVID-19 series, uh, which was organized by the ISP. And uh, within this session on paid and COVID-19 across the globe, I would like to bring you some insights from the Germany with some published data and also some ongoing projects. So to start with my agenda for today, I would like to bring some literature on the impact of the pandemic and restriction measures on chronic pain patients in Germany. These are some um, projects uh, which have been accomplished in, within the last year. And in the second part, I would like to um, share with you some um, thoughts and also some ongoing projects about the post-COVID syndrome in uh, German populations being studied and also pain as one of uh, its symptoms. So I'll start with one study from Kiel, from uh, the north part of Germany, which was one of the uh, first studies um, on the um, effects of the pandemic on patients with chronic pain and the group around um, Ralph Baron and Jan Janne Geertmüllen um, have looked at a patient group of patients with um, painful polyneuropathy from an older study, which was um, uh, very um, convenient because these patients were very well characterized. Knowing that pain interference is influenced by social isolation and most of the therapeutic interventions aiming at decreasing social connection, um, they hypothesized that in patients with painful neuropathy, the emotional well being and the pain intensity would deteriorate due to the pandemic and social isolation. And they performed a questionnaire survey starting um, about two weeks after the uh, lockdown uh, in uh, the spring of 2020 in Germany. And they assessed um, pain intensity and characteristics, pain interference, uh, but also emotional well being and sleep quality, personality characteristics, quality of life, and some information about. COVID-19 pandemic associated changes of daily living. Um, actually, um, by the end, um, 43 patients with a stable disease could be included in the final analysis. And it was about two years after the baseline assessment prior to the pandemic. Um, they included only stable patients to be able to compare the effects of the pandemic independent of the disease um, progression. So these patients had a stable pain medication and um, interestingly, the mean pain intensity remained as stable or even improved in this cohort and the um, PCS rumination score decreased. So they have um, interpreted their results as uh, some kind of honeymoon or heroic stage um, at this stage of the um, lockdown um, in Germany. And the results suggest um, a possible shift of attention from uh, the chronic pain condition to the um, global threat of the pandemic. When uh, looking more detailed into the data and um, dividing the patients into two subgroups of those uh, who reported um, or experienced a change of social life and those who did not. Interestingly, patients who experienced a change of social life had increased pain ratings, reported less quality of life and demonstrated more pain catastrophizing thoughts. And it, it is very curious to see um, the development of this cohort. And um, fortunately, the uh, group uh, around Ralph Baron and Janne Giertmüllen um, has followed them later on. And we can be eager to read about the follow up data from this study. Another 
cohort has been studied um, also based on a survey, but this was based on an um, app-based analysis ret retrospectively. These were um, people with primary headaches and it is known that primary headaches are um, being influenced um, regarding the um, headache attacks and their frequency also perceived intensity due to external factors like sleep um, or stress or changes of everyday routine. And this study group um, looked at uh, um, a large cohort of patients using an electronic headache diary, and they hypothesized two possible consequences of the lockdown measures, either a worsening of headaches due to the increased psychological stress and poorer healthcare resources, or an improvement due to fewer work-related stressors and more self-care at home, because at this stage in Germany, the home office um, uh, has been introduced and also um, um, persons which were not in uh, um, society um, crucial uh, positions um, were um, advised or instructed to work at home office. So the primary outcome was the change in month headaches um, days between the baseline um, assessed uh, prior to the lockdown and the first lockdown month. The daily recordings uh, which uh, have been analyzed were from uh, um, around about 2,300 patients in the first lockdown month. Interestingly, the number of headache days um, and also specifically the monthly migraine days um, did not change um, within the first lockdown month in Germany, uh, but the mon monthly days with acute medication use um, re was reduced. And when looking um, into uh, the activity level or um, energy level, mood stress level, sleep duration and quality, um, in this cohort, within the first lockdown month, the um, activity level reduced, the um, stress level reduced also. Um, the reported mood was uh, better, the sleep duration was um, uh, higher, and the overall energy level um, reported from this uh, cohort improved. They looked also at data uh, in the following months and daily recordings from uh, about 500 patients um, were analyzed up to the third lockdown month. And interestingly, um, there was no change in headache frequency and intensity in those patients suffering from migraine or, and or tension type headache during the first three months of the lockdown in Germany in spring 2020. So these are interesting data and when Looking into another um, pain syndrome, also um, a survey uh, from uh, Germany from um, obstetrics. Um, also, looking at the influence um, of the pandemic situation in uh, the beginning of the pandemic, they um, aimed to assess alterations in pain perception and also the specific uh, pain-induced disabilities in a cohort of patients with endometriosis, which is also um, um, associated with pain. And they looked uh, also at changes in the emotional and social aspects um, during social isolation or quarantine. Um, it was an online questionnaire survey, which was uh, very comprehensive uh, with a duration of about 30 minutes and was active in April, 2020. So looking at the um, data, 
they reported that pain intensity decreased significantly um, for dysmenorrhea, but remained unchanged for all other pain modalities. And when looking at pain disability, um, they reported an improvement in the areas of social, occupational, and sexual functioning and um, deterioration of function with respect to family functioning. The authors um, comment on it as uh, possibly the effect of uh, women uh, who were more involved in uh, the family um, issues like homeschooling and others. So another study looked at a, a later stage of the pandemic um, and they assessed um, in a tertiary um, pain clinic, um, again, the effects of the pandemic, um, but later on um, from May to July, 2020, and compared data from uh, these assessment um, to the last visit of the patients uh, before the shutdown period. Interestingly, in this um, survey, about um, yeah, seventy percent reported a subjective deterioration of the pain disorder, but there was no actual difference between the uh, answers from the questionnaires um, after the pandemic and um, the data prior to the pandemic. And they looked uh, or intended to um, to, to um, analyze for significant associations between demographical and medical data. And the, those reported were, um, three of them were significant and they had um, um, actually um, no clinical relevance. So the um, interpretation is quite hard in this um, survey. This is one part of the picture, but the other one is the long-term pain associated with COVID-19. Um, in patients who were not primary chronic pain uh, patients uh, prior to pandemic. Actually, um, it is um, plausible that neurological complications uh, which were being reported um, in uh, connection to COVID-19 in disease um, can be associated with pain. For example, there are uh, several um, uh, multiple reports on uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome or GBS uh, variants from different countries. And it is known from previous surveys that more than one third of uh, those patients report pain even after one year. Another possible pain related condition uh, would be um, um, induced myopathy or myositis. Also cerebrovascular events um, were um, found to um, be um, associated to, especially with severe COVID-19 um, um, disease. And um, the larger number would be um, also um, a reason for a higher prevalence of post-stroke uh, pain which was reported from previous data in up to 65% of those patients. And last but not least, critical illness neuropathy or myopathy, or even both, um, which have to be assumed um, to occur also within the COVID-19 pandemic, even in a large extent due to factors uh, such as disease severity and presence of an acute respiratory distress syndrome, which are risk factors for these conditions um, can also be um, associated with long-term pain. And these are only some examples. When looking at uh, the so-called post-COVID uh, syndrome or long COVID, um, there has been um, several or multiple um, publications looking at different uh, populations. And this uh, is a systematic review and meta-analysis summarizing data um, on um, the long-term effects of COVID-19. 
And there are more than 50 different sy symptoms which were characterized um, with pain being uh, or playing a major role also starting uh, from headache, but also joint pain, chest pain, general pain. Some uh, studies differentiate between myalgia and uh, nerve pain. So this is a problem which um, has to be um, further studied um, to um, have a prevention strategies. In Germany, uh, seen, um, recently has been published an expert consensus uh, guideline about post-COVID um, or long COVID syndrome. And um, several um, societies have been um, involved and um, it um, is suggested to differentiate between primary and secondary types of headache, muscle and joint pain and neuropathic pain. And until now, there is no known prevention or causal treatment for long COVID associated pain. And the symptomatic treatment depends on the pain syndrome according to their treatment guidelines. But it has to be um, acknowledged that pain is a um, part in, in a, in a biopsychosocial uh, context um, can be also um, associated with um, psychological comorbidities and the role of uh, those within the post-COVID uh, syndrome um, is still not sufficiently um, um, studied. So when looking uh, uh, on the impact of post-COVID syndrome in Germany, it has to be stated that in Germany, the occupational insurance um, policy is um, very uh, well organized and um, the um, goal is to um, provide the best possible care for um, patients with occupational diseases. And in terms of the health uh, working, um, population uh, within the health sector in hospitals and other um, institutions, it is um, really notable that since um, the onset of the pandemic until the end of uh, June um, 2021, more than um, 82,000 occupational diseases due to um, SARS-CoV to infection have been approved, which is a really, really large number. Um, and the problem of course is that if a, a significant part of um, those patients suffer post COVID syndrome, it has um, um, extreme impact on the social um, life and also on the occupational life um, of these uh, subjects. So um, currently there is an ongoing register study with multidimensional interdisciplinary assessment of patients with persistent post-COVID symptoms in case with acute infection acquired in the occupational context and um, there are several um, participating centers um, in six hospitals under the leadership of our University Hospital Bergmansal in Bochum, the Department of Neurology, looking at different uh, aspects of um, the post-COVID symptoms, which are, of course, um, quite um, um, varying between individuals and also looking um, in the context of occupational diseases, of course, um, it's important to um, pay attention on possible um, conflicting goals also in um, terms of possible factors um, impairing the healing process, also biopsychological um, and social factors. Another study aiming to um, objectify the um, consequences of the post-COVID um, syndrome and also to under better understand um, the pathophysiology, which is hard um, to um, 
which is still hard understood, is a study which we have uh, started aiming to characterize the pain in the neuromuscular long COVID symptoms. And we want to um, establish a database of multimodal profiling, including um, a patient related outcomes, but also um, extensive assessment of morphological aberrations using, uh, for example, skin biopsies or um, also MRI, um, quantitative uh, muscle MRI and um, other methods like the quantitative sensory testing to um, um, detect dysfunctional patterns and aiming um, to better understand the pathophysiology and um, be able to conclude possible prevention strategies and also treatment um, optimization in those cohorts. So a pilot study is um, currently recruiting patients in our hospital and there are two other university hospitals in Kiel and in Würzburg involved. And um, this is uh, a study which um, we will be happy to report further on um, when uh, the results are um, there. So these are the insights which I brought from Germany for you and I want to thank you for attention and also thank you, uh, thank to the um, collaborators in our hospital and also in other um, clinics um, in Germany. And um, thank you for attention again. Hello, I am Santosh Chaturvedi, a consultant psychiatrist. I have been a member of the International Association for Study of Pain since 1986. And I would like to thank the IESP for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, COVID-19 and pain uh, across the globe and talk about the uh, disparities, equities and inequities. And I'm going to share with you what is happening in my country in India. And I'm sure that this is not very different from uh, what is happening in many other places, but uh, still there are certain things that I would like to uh, discuss with you and hope that this would bring about some discussion in uh, further uh, in the end. So I'm going to talk about access to healthcare in India. And uh, like uh, we all know that the Corona waves in India were not very different from the rest of the world. Uh, in the beginning uh, last year, we used a lot of preventive strategies, restrictions, lockdowns, which affected the migrant population. There were a number of medical treatments, and now the situation about hospital beds, ICU, care and ventilators, oxygen demand and supply, and the role of vaccination and newer treatments. So for preventive techniques, the country used what other countries used, which was advised by the WHO and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. There were educational posters and videos, use of mass media and national television and social media. There were no separate instructions for persons with disabilities, chronic diseases and chronic pain. And Unfortunately, the methods were not very strictly followed by the public and they were not followed very consistently. So this led to restrictions and lockdowns in the first wave, which affected the migrant population to a great extent. Again, during the lockdown, uh, chronic pain patients had a lot of problems and difficulties and they had to suffer a lot. There were no special uh, you know, endeavors done to help them. There were relaxations to the restrictions in late 2020 and the first quarter of this year, most preventive measures were sadly abandoned. And hence we are seeing now a second wave in the country, which is being very, very horrendous and it is spreading like wildfire. Again, which has brought about partial lockdowns and moderate restrictions have been reimposed. So during this uh, year and a half, I would say, number of medical treatments have been uh, proposed. Uh, there was a confusion about the role of uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, but there is role of some of the analgesics like uh, paracetamol and blood thinners like ecospirin. A lot of uh, you know, antivirals have come into market. Remdesivir is uh, one of the most popular ones. 
But more importantly, many Indian traditional treatments like the use of spices, camphor, steam inhalation, prone breathing, yoga, meditation, and many other home remedies have been proposed. What we are facing in this wave is something very, very serious, and it is to do with healthcare. We, there is acute shortage of hospital beds, ICU care, and ventilators. And this is because there is an increased demand. And there are a lot of people who are getting uh, uh, infected and they have nowhere to go. The patients have to wait for a long time uh, in the waiting list and search for uh, the facilities. There have been a lot of deaths which have been occurring due to the non-availability of the ICU care and hospital beds. Though most of the hospitals have been converted for COVID uh, care. Uh, and this has given rise to that the other acute and chronic conditions, including chronic pain conditions, are being neglected. The problem about oxygen demand is uh, something which is uh, you know, unexpected and uh, because uh, of the breathing difficulties and the impact on lungs, uh, patients have been requiring oxygen. So there is a shortage of oxygen cylinders in hospitals. Uh, some companies have come up with home oxygen concentrators and the production is being enhanced and there has been import, but it is still not meeting the demand. Vaccinations seem to be a very important uh, part of uh, preventing future episodes or future waves. Vaccination was started age-wise, first to elderly population, then those above 45, and now they have opened it for those above 18 years. But there is an acute shortage of vaccines. And uh, you know there is a bit of bureaucracy because one has to give a proof of uh, identity to be able to get that. There's a shortage of vaccines and there is a great inequity in distribution. So people who are from poor areas or uneducated, who do not have a smartphone, who do not have a uh, ID, they are not able to uh, get the vaccinations on time. Trials in the children and adolescents have just recently started. There are some newer strategies and innovations and trials have been going on in the country. Uh, a, a new drug, uh, the 2-deoxyglucose uh, has been, uh, the trials have been completed and it has been approved by the Drug Controller General of India for emergency adjunct use. Similarly, there are trials going on on nitrous oxide and how it can improve uh, vascularization and use of oxygen. And there are other medications also which are in the testing stage. So access to other health care has been severely affected. And especially patients with non-communicable diseases, diabetes, hypertension, which are actually high risk for COVID and chronic pain patients have been affected mainly because the hospitals are catering to mainly COVID related diseases. Care for other disorders, including cancer, infection, non-communicable diseases has also been severely impaired. Needless to say, pain management has been a victim of all this uh, uh, attention given to COVID. And the pain management has been severely affected. Pain clinics are not a priority for the country. Doctors and hospitals are focusing on COVID-related conditions. And NSAIDs are being used for COVID symptoms and fever and not really for pain. So we are expecting many post-COVID conditions and syndromes which are related to chronic pain. So we think that there might be long COVID-19 symptoms, uh, mainly in the form of chronic pain, anxiety, fear, adjustment disorders, emotional problems, functional symptoms like fatigue and tiredness, tingling, health-related anxieties. So it is very important to identify these for chronic pain patients because these emotional factors and anxieties will increase the prevalence of chronic pain or increase the severity of the pain experience. So pain clinicians need to account for these factors in their clinical practice in future. So how do we improve the management of pain, fatigue, and bodily distress? This is possible by early assessment and intervention for pain. And like I said, uh, health anxiety, psychosomatic symptoms, psychiatric disorders, medically unexplained symptoms, functional somatic symptoms, especially in the form of pain, are going to come in future as a consequence of the pandemic. Already in my practice and other clinicians are reporting functional and medically unexplained symptoms such as fatigue, tiredness, bodily distress, aches and pains, 
aggravation of chronic pain if they have had due to anxiety and tension and due to the viral infection like uh, other influenzas. So there are also now uh, reports of that there might be something like a corona neurosis, which can be seen in clinical practice, where persons uh, who have had corona uh, infection or COVID-19 infection would show abnormal illness behavior and maladaptive ways of coping with their COVID-related fears and anxieties. So what do we see in future? In future, we think that there would be, uh, the current difficulties are enormous and gradually they will be met. And we have to be prepared for the future third or fourth wave and look out for features of long COVID as well as post-COVID complications. Post-COVID chronic pain and fatigue are expected and efforts should be made uh, for adequate pain management and good quality of life in future. So this is uh, my presentation and I think it is very important that the IASP should focus on chronic pain and newer syndromes of chronic pain which will come uh, as a part of long COVID or as a part of consequence of people who have had uh, COVID-19 infection or there might be complications because of the vaccinations or because of the treatments which have been given. So with these few words, once again, thank you very much. Stay safe, stay masked, and uh, maintain social distance. Thank you very much. So first I want to thank you very much, uh, the organizing uh, committee for having invited me to give this presentation. It's really an honor for me. And my presentation is about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on people who live with chronic pain in Canada. I have no conflict of interest to declare. In March, 2020, community uh, COVID transmission uh, was confirmed in Canada and rapid closure of daycare, school, workplace, and non-essential services occurred to varying degrees across the Canadian province and territories. Restriction to private and public uh, gathering along with closure of borders were also put in place. Here is a map of, the, of Canada, which include 10 provinces and three territories. You can see that three provinces, Alberta, uh, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, you can see that three provinces, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec were particularly affected during the first wave of the pandemic. The subsequent waves of the pandemic mainly affected the three same provinces plus British Columbia as revealed by the number of cases reported daily. The pandemic have, has important biopsychosocial impact and especially in vulnerable individuals such as those who live with chronic pain. We know that a multidisciplinary a treatment is the optimal paradigm for the management of chronic pain. However, we conducted a study two, uh, two years ago in which uh, we found that Canadian multidisciplinary pain treatment clinics are unable to meet clinical demands both in terms of regional accessibility and reasonable wait time. Most of the clinic are located in large urban centers and the median time for a first grade appointment in Canada is six months 
and can be as long as four years. As mid-March 2020, pain clinic across Canada had to shut down or reduce their face-to-face -face operation in order to comply with the restriction measure. Lynch and her collaborator conducted a survey to explore the impact of the pandemic on the ability of Canadian pain clinics to provide care, and they are also examined which strategy the clinic used to deliver services to patients during the pandemic. They published the results in the Canadian Journal of Pain, and uh, they, what they did is they sent an online a survey to the academic pain director of Canada, which will represent 23 adult pain clinic, and they had a response rate of 74%. Although most clinics continue to see some new patients, many of them added new reference to their wait list, such that patients were were waiting longer to receive care. The clinic responded by offering telehealth option, including phone and internet-based video appointments. All clinic indicated that they would like to continue uh, to offer distance treatment if infrastructure and funding could continue. Although more, uh, uh, like I was mentioning before, uh, multimodal treatment is the optimal treat, uh, paradigm for the management of chronic pain. So this means that we, uh, that uh, careful balance between pharmacological, physical and psychological approaches is desirable, but it can be hard to achieve and it can be easily disrupted. However, what were the impact from the patient perspective? So we conducted a study to assess the effect of the pandemic on patient treatments. And uh, we use a web-based a mixed method design. We conducted two online survey and uh, two online survey, and we carry out uh, in-depth su semi-structured qualitative interviews. Participants to our study had to be aged 18 years old or older, live in Canada report pain for more than three months and able to complete a questionnaire online. We use a vast web-based recruitment strategy, including advertisement via chronic pain patient association, social media, and we have been successful in recruiting more than 3,000 participants. Uh, we also uh, organized a draw to, for the participants to win one of the 10 100 prepaid visa gifts. Our study was approved by my institutional uh, research ethic boards and patient partners were involved in every step of the study. The study was launched roughly one month after the state of, uh, of emergency was declared in most Canadian provinces. The online survey uh, was carried out during the first COVID-19 wave in Canada. Shortly after, we conducted 22 qualitative interviews 
to get a deeper understanding of the patient experience. And then we administered a follow-up questionnaire about seven months later, which corresponded to the second, to the peak of the second uh, wave in Canada. Participants mainly came from Quebec, Ontario and British Columbia, which rank in the top hot zones. Our sample was mainly composed of women who were aged 50 years on the average, and the, the pain was present for more than 10 years in half of our sample. Among people who were using pain medication prior to the pandemic, 15% reported that they had to change their pharmacological treatment due to the pandemic. The fact that few participants were impacted in terms of pharmacological treatment suggests that relatively effective measures were put in place for many patients, for example, telemedicine, prescription prolongation, and so on, and so on. The most frequent reason uh, for change in pharmacological treatment were increased pain, loss of access to prescribers, or increase in medication to compensate for the stop of non-pharmacological approaches. When interviewed, several participants reported that procedure to get a prescription fields were much more complicated, as you can see in this quote of one of our participants. With regard to non-pharmacological treatment, that is physical and psychological pain treatment, more than half of our participant reported that they had to modify their physical or psychological pain treatment due to the pandemic. The most frequent reason were a lack of access or the need to compensate for stopping another treatment. I won't go through all factors factors which were significantly associated with change in pain treatment. Let's just mention that disparity were found in terms of type of clinic where the patient received their follow-up, their, their pain follow-up, the province of residence, sex, and age. Data collected during the qualitative interviews pointed out to socioeconomic inequities, especially uh, with poorer treatment access for women, racialized, indigenous, and economically deprived persons. During the second wave of the pandemic, we ask additional questions about opioid and cannabis use. Among participants who use opioid before the pandemic, 18% reported that they had to increase their dose, while 3% reported that the pandemic context forced them to start or restart opioid treatment. Among the cannabis users before the pandemic, 40% reported that their use had increased since the beginning of the first wave. So th this study uh, was, uh, this pan-Canadian study was the first of its kind to quantify the impact of the pandemic on the pharmacological 
and phys uh, physical and psychological treatment of chronic pain among uh, adults. In this same study, we also examined the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the patient pains and their emotional well-being. The uh, objective were also to identify, identify factors associated with pain deterioration and psychological distress. We ask our participants to rate the start the status of their pain since the beginning of the pandemic, and we dichotomize their responses into deter pain, deter deteriorated pain, and non deteriorated pain. Uh, we also use the PHQ4 to assess their emotional uh, well-being and we dichotomize their psychological distress into no or mild symptoms and moderate to severe symptoms. A total of 2,415 participants completed the required variable for our uh, regression analysis. More than two thirds were aged between 40 and 69 years, and three quarters were living in the provinces most affected by the pandemic. More than two thirds of our participants reported pain deterioration since the beginning of the pandemic. In terms of positive finding though, the qualitative interviews reveal uh, that the pandemic had some positive aspect, especially a better understanding of the condition of people who live with con uh, chronic pain, and especially in terms of social isolation. We conducted a, a multivariable logistic regression analysis to identify the variables which were associated with increased odds of reporting deteriorated pain. And in fact, change in pain treatment since uh, the onset of the pandemic had the strongest association with pain deterioration. People who were older and who lost their job during the pandemic were less likely to report pain deterioration. Almost half of our study participants reported moderate to severe psychological distress during the two weeks preceding our study. Participants who had higher intensity of negative emotion toward the, pan, the, the pandemic and who had higher level, who reported higher level of stress were more likely to report moderate to severe psychological distress. We did not find any association between pain deterioration or psychological distress and regional variation in COVID-19 uh, uh, infection rate, residence setting, and number of public health safety measures. So in conclusion, the COVID-19 pandemic had a negative uh, impact on access to pain relief, especially for non-pharmacological treatment for uh, the Canadian who live with chronic pain. Uh, <clears throat> accessing healthcare resources was intensified for economically deprived persons who live with chronic pain change in pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatment 
were associated with worse outcomes in terms of pain deterioration. On the positive side, though, was the development of at this distance treatment for chronic pain. It's important to point out that many of the factors associated with worse outcomes during the pandemic are modifiable. In the future, it will be important that all people uh, living with chronic pain have adequate access to, uh, uh, to treatment. Continuity of care should also be prioritized. There is a need to develop online intervention and KT activities to inform and empower people regarding non-pharmacological treatment when the usual ones are not impossible. It's also important in health crisis context to offer not only support for pain management, but also for stress management. Outside of our study, Canadian data is beginning to appear in the literature and will help guide the implementation of concrete solution for people uh, who live with chronic pain. In closing, I would like to acknowledge the uh, contribution of uh, the, the organization who funded this, which funded this study. All our study participants uh, are the, the Pain BC team, our patient partner, research assistant, and the research team. And I thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everybody. So thank you, Dr. Dr. Elena and Dr. Santosh, uh, and also Dr. Dr. Chonier for your presentation. Uh, we are trying to understand the impact of COVID-19 across the globe through three, three examples from Germany, from India, and from Canada. And uh, I have some questions to you, and I think we could discuss this topic that is a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, I would start with Dr. Elena. If you could uh, give more details about uh, these two big studies that are ongoing, and how do you think they are going to to allow us to understand uh, the, the impacts of COVID-19 on pain and vice versa? Yes, um, thank you again for uh, having the opportunity to present in this uh, session. Um, we are currently interested on, uh, the, in the impact of post-COVID syndrome and pain is uh, one of uh, the symptoms uh, which is um, reported for a lot of patients who, who we have seen until now. And I work in a um, hospital which is um, specialized for occupational diseases. So we see now a lot of um, um, subjects who are working in the area of healthcare sector have suffered um, a corona, a COVID-19 disease and um, still have complaints. And one of these studies in um, collaboration with um, five other hospitals specialized for um, um, occupational diseases looks uh, very carefully at those patients uh, and looks also um, about um, uh, or tries to characterize um, objective uh, abnormalities and to be able to correlate to, uh, to the subjective symptoms. And it also seems uh, that uh, psychological factors uh, play a major role as already here Sant uh, um, Dr. Santos um, mentioned. And that is why we wanted to look in the other study by very deep profiling of uh, 
subjects with pain and other neuromuscular symptoms like dysesthesia or others, whether we are able to find um, um, abnormalities using these uh, different methods, looking uh, at a possible neuropathy or myopathy at different levels and also blood samples looking for a possible um, autoimmune reaction because for uh, us it is very unclear um, to what part uh, or to what extent um, the long COVID disease has the psychological factors who are maintaining it and to what extent there are other pathophysiological mechanisms which we hope that when um, or being able to identify them would allow us also um, treatment preventions because if we have uh, if we make calculation the higher number of uh, subjects uh, all over the world being um, affected from the acute um, infection um, when uh, a large part of them suffers from long-term uh, problems it is of course a global social uh, problem um, so in Germany it seems to be uh, uh, or it's interesting that um, the different insurances whether you had the infection as an occupational disease during your work as a doctor or nurse or something uh, else or whether you had it in your private um, life. Uh, I don't know whether uh, there are any differences in India um, during the uh, between um, these two aspects and what kind of psychological burden um, it uh, has to do with them. Yes, Dr. Santosh, you as a um, specialist on mental health, you could ask th this question for us. And also I would add, uh, do you think uh, the impact of the COVID pandemic is more mental than other aspects? <laughs> That's a very interesting question that you have asked, yeah. Uh, uh, one will wonder, you know, a virus is a very small thing, but the impact on mind is much more. And uh, most other, uh, you know, difficulties of breathing or its uh, impact on different uh, systems like kidney and gastroenterology they, or cardiology, they, they recover. But the uh, mental problems are very, very chronic. And... Uh, when we look at even the previous pandemics and epidemics like of influenza in the 50s and 60s, they caused a lot of uh, psychological symptoms. And one of them is health anxiety. And health anxiety has become an anxiety for even the minor symptoms. You know, if anybody sneezes or cough and cold, and then they worry that whether they have got uh, COVID-19 and uh, or if they get bodily symptoms, you know. Uh, so what, what I mentioned, what we are seeing is we don't have any systematic research on that, but we know that a lot of people are coming with uh, uh, medically unexplained symptoms and they think that they have got COVID. And so it is becoming that they are getting tested again and again. And uh, they, when they find negative, then they come to know that the course of the disease is very funny you might, uh, it's not like today, you know, you get exposed to a person and then you get COVID-19. You have to wait for uh, 48 hours, 72 hours. People get it even after five days. So there is no end to that. So coming with that to the question with Dr. Elena was asking about the situation in India, uh, COVID-19 is not really covered by the insurance. And um, it's it's very, I mean, it was an eye-opener for me that it is considered as occupational hazard. Even for doctors, it was not covered. And I wish I knew this before that we could have taken it as an advocacy, that at least for doctors, it should be covered by the institute, by the uh, government. So COVID-19 in India, being a, you know, a developing country, is a very expensive disease. The testing is expensive. Hospitalization is expensive. All the treatments are expensive. 
So people do not know how to get treated. I mean, uh, people have gone broke because of uh, one so one person gets admitted. It it is causing uh, costing them you know uh, uh, long lakhs of rupees, which is you know uh, in, in 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 all their family savings are going, and the outcome is not very good because a lot of people have expired. So uh, it's it's very it was a sad situation. Now it is stabilized, and we think that we are coming on the way to recovery. Cases are gradually decreasing. Uh, but we really don't know because a lot of people are not testing and they have a fear of getting testing because they know that if they test positive, they will be put in isolation, they will be deprived of their family. So it's, uh, you know, along with vaccine hesitancy, there is testing hesitancy also. Yes, this is interesting because uh, although testing uh, is a factor, uh, that is, a, is the main factor, right? Yes. So I, I was searching for the numbers and I saw that uh, the United States, uh, India and Brazil, my country, are more or less similar in terms of infections and deaths. But, yes. le but uh, let's speak about that. That is very uh, hard measure. Yes. Uh, at the same time, uh, India has more than the double of the population of United States or Brazil. So it seems there is a, a, a lesser or smaller incidence of the disease or death because of COVID-19. And at the same time, India is known, very known around the world by its uh, mind-body techniques such as yoga, as you mentioned, do you think this uh, factor is an important factor in the, uh, in the severity of the disease? Oh, well, Dr. Baptista, you have raised a very interesting point. I don't think people are thinking like that, but now that you point it out, it seems when people were isolated and they were uh, uh, you know, in a lockdown at home, the only thing they could do was yoga and meditation and using traditional methods. So that has something to do with pain also, because pain symptoms became less. Uh, I mean, there is no uh, study, but I know that the pain complaints by chronic pain patients became less. And, uh, you know, people uh, because of, uh, uh, so the stress also gave resilience. It gave resilience. So stress and coping and resilience to uh, deal with this. You know, uh, because we see in India, so many other misfortunes. We are used to misfortunes and COVID-19 is another one. So we'd say, okay, this is also one more thing uh, given by God. And, you know, uh, we need to, this is our karma. Uh, we need to suffer this. So uh, uh, they, they, they were able to cope with it. And I think in this, uh, the traditional methods, the mind-body relationship, doing yoga and meditation and, uh, you know, uh, changing the diet and many other things, like I mentioned, some of these things like camphor, which increases, uh, you know, uh, the breathing and airway. It was maybe it was psychological, but people thought that we are doing something. We are doing something to, uh, uh, you know, cope with this. So all these various other factors have probably played a very important role. And that has made people to uh, deal with this pandemic and cope with the pandemic. And you are absolutely right, uh, though the population is almost two times uh, the, the number of severe cases have been much less. But on the other hand, coming back to the question uh, about Elena and doctors, we were very shocked that a lot of doctors who had got vaccination, they got the disease and many of them died. Many of my friends died. So that is uh, something very shocking. And now the recent phenomena has been with this Delta variant uh, is that uh, many times it's not picked up. So what clinicians are doing is we are not going by the test and the result. We are going by signs and symptoms. If signs and symptoms are suggestive of COVID infection, we even if the testing is negative, we still go ahead and think that and treat it like a COVID-19. This is an interesting question and an, an interesting disparity probably because for instance, is it, it, it should be very different from India and, and Germany. Do you want yes. to comment this aspect, Dr. Elena? 
Um, I found it very interesting, as you said, that a lot of people um, um, did yoga or meditation at home and it was their way of um, coping. And I think this is even something common between India and Germany. The one study I have presented, for example, on patients with primary headaches, which um, described that the um, number of headache attacks did not change, but people uh, took significantly less pain medication because it was the time, the first weeks in Germany, uh, it was end of March and um, uh, at the beginning of April, 2020, uh, it was uh, a really hard uh, lockdown and um, almost everybody was instructed to stay at home, to do not go to work and to work from home office um, where possible, of course, except for uh, except crucial uh, professions like doctors or um, 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 others like, or nurses or some others, of course. But maybe this is one point that uh, when people with primary headaches um, did not have um, uh, this um, stress to function at work, um, it led to a, a, a lot of positive effects, the lockdown, um, including also less um, need for pain medication, better functioning and so on. So those who were able to cope with it um, have profited. Of course, it's only the beginning of the social isolation and those effects, whether they are still um, visible um, after longer uh, uh, pandemic, uh, what we have now one year later. Um, well, I don't know any data on that. Yes, it's hard to have uh, data uh, right now because uh, things are changing a lot, right? Yeah. But uh, I, I'd like to have your impression about another symptom that uh, has to do also many times with uh, pain that is fatigue. And uh, that seems to be more important in the post COVID syndrome than pain. Uh, I, I was reading a systematic review that uh, Dr. Elena presented and uh, pain is uh, more or less, this has more or less the same prevalence as uh, respiratory symptoms, and this was a respiratory disease initially. Uh, but fatigue is more than the double. What is your impression about fatigue and the relation to pain? What have you seen in your practice? Uh, if uh, Dr. Elena can comment, and then Dr. Santosh, please. Um. Well, it's a very interesting question and also a quite hard question <laughs> um, because here is something I don't know whether it is possible to differentiate at the current time the exact mechanisms of the fatigue in those patients. We know from other inflammatory diseases like um, multiple sclerosis or others that they are associated with fatigue. and. Um, surely there is some kind of um, 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 probably Im immune um, reaction may might be postulated. But the other question is, of course, the role of psychological factors, um, which may um, um, maintain or um, contribute to these fatigue symptoms. I think it's uh, at the current, from as far as I know about literature and my um, experience, it's uh, quite hard to um, separate both factors within the fatigue symptom complex. Yes, thank you. Dr. Santosh. Yeah, uh, I was alluding to this that uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know, the chronic fatigue syndrome, which we see very commonly in uh, psychiatric practice as well as medical practice, uh, uh, many of us believe that it is a post-viral phenomenon. And it was, you know, it started uh, and uh, like neurasthenia uh, and uh, chronic fatigue syndrome 
many people think it's uh, post viral and they even find high antibody teeters of virus, you know, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, Epstein Barr virus or something else that it is there, which we suspect. So, uh, one of the things which I mentioned in my presentation is that in the uh, consequences of COVID, because COVID, uh, the uh, COVID-19 virus is also been, uh, you know, affecting the uh, uh, different systems of the body. And in maybe in six months time, one year time, two years time, we will get a lot of people having chronic fatigue syndrome, which would be post COVID-19 related to that. And that will be, you know, uh, as Dr. Elena mentioned, we really don't know what is the pathophysiology of that. It might be uh, because of post-inflammation or it might be because of, uh, you know, immune system or it becomes like an autoimmune disorder later on. Or it might be because it, has, uh, it affects numerous systems of the body, uh, cardiac and renal and endocrines. And so we gradually we will come to understand the pathophysiology. But uh, my, my, my clinical impression is that we are going to see an increase in fatigue syndromes in future, much more than uh, you know, uh, 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 chronic pain syndromes. Chronic pain syndrome will also be there. It will, in future, it will be there because of the stress and worry about uh, the long-term consequences. And as we know, as we have seen, that uh, pain is a multidimensional uh, components, and stress and psychological factors, emotional factors play a very important role, uh, similar to the nociceptive or the neuro-nociceptive part. So we are going to see uh, much more chronic pain in future and much more chronic fatigue in future, which would be related to the COVID uh, pandemics. Yes, uh, 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 still about fatigue. We, we have seen in Brazil some patients that they cannot uh, arrive to the health facilities because they cannot walk from, uh, for instance, the train station to the health facility. He can, these persons cannot walk, cannot do their, their household uh, tasks and so on. And this may, may be an important factor in the access, access to healthcare facilities. How uh, do this problem is uh, deal in your country that are very different? Our countries are very different in this aspect. Yes. Well, in, in, in India, fatigue is not considered as a serious symptom, you know, and uh, people think that uh, the symptoms of fatigue and depression are quite similar. In both of them, uh, there is psychomotor retardation, uh, activity levels have decreased, uh, fatigue causes depression, depression causes fatigue. So they think that uh, if a person reports of fatigue, they think he's not coping well. Sometimes they think they are just uh, you know, making an excuse and that it is considered as an abnormal illness behavior. So uh, fatigue is uh, uh, not given seriousness in a medical thing. On the other hand, many other herbal traditional medications, they are being uh, popularized to take care of fatigue. So we find that over the counter and uh, you know, uh, many, many quacks and others, they would come and say that, you know, you take this, you will become strong. So they, it, 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 it is the many medicines for strength are being popularized, but it is not considered so much as a medical illness uh, even, you know, pain is, of course, considered uh, given more importance, but nothing as compared to cancer. You know, cancer is probably the most, uh, you know, uh, important uh, health condition. Then comes the non-communicable diseases, then chronic pain. But fatigue is considered as one of those symptoms because there is no sign of it. At least in pain, you can find tenderness. And in pain, you can find, uh, you know, you can do a visual rating. If fatigue is so much subjective that people uh, find it hard to believe that person is having fatigue. And they will say, now, why are you having fatigue? You are eating well, sleeping well, doing everything. They don't understand that fatigue is also something with which a person can suffer. So there are these cross-cultural differences in presentation of symptoms and how they are perceived to be important or not important. And hence, uh, the suffering goes on.
And in Germany, Dr. Elena? Uh, well, it is not very different. There is, of course, um, um, a discussion, especially, um, for example, in our hospital, where we see all, also patients who are not go getting back to work, it's always the question, what is the, um, the role of uh, psychological factors, or is it some kind of um, depressive disorder, which uh, was pre-existing or um, an exaggerated or um, comes on top of it. Of course, there is a discussion uh, about fatigue uh, and the um, um, inflammatory role, um, but um, it's not, as Dr. Santosh said, uh, when you see, when you do not have a clinical sign or an abnormality in the clinical examination, uh, it is not very um, easy to, um, well, to, to objectify the extent of the fatigue and depending on the um, different persons describe it in different ways. So, um, it, I think there is something where both uh, um, countries are similar. Um, a disease like cancer or stroke or something where you see the disease um, is much more um, accepted. Um, pain syndromes are also, uh, meanwhile, there's a lot of uh, um, education and also um, communication about pain syndromes, chronic pain, but fatigue is uh, something which is coming now into focus in uh, the context of the post-COVID uh, or long-COVID discussion. How yes. is it in Brazil? What is... Uh, Brazil, what, it's what... the same thing. <laughs> I think it's ev everywhere the same thing, but the problem is becoming bigger when... Uh, uh, people cannot come back to work. Yes, so exactly. That's also here, yeah. They start to believe that is a problem. And I'm working with uh, some physicians that didn't believe in fatigue until they had COVID. <laughs> and uh, it seems uh, we found, uh, we are following a, a, a way that uh, people that were dependent from uh, oxygen, they, uh, some of them show a uh, decrease in, uh, in the volume of the gray matter in the prefrontal cortex that may be related to psychological symptoms, uh, anxiety, and also fatigue. Uh, we have here uh, two questions, one from Erica, uh, for, for, for Dr. Santos, which traditional medicine substances increased in India? Uh, well, uh, many of these uh, were uh, related to food items and uh, certain items were considered to be giving uh, more strength. And, uh, uh, you know, people started using them. And uh, this included basil, and, uh, you know, some of these spices, and uh, like I said, uh, those were for eating, but uh, camphor and other uh, things which would, uh, you know, uh, uh, increase the uh, effect of breathing, they were also increased. Uh, we saw people, you know, advising prone uh, breathing, I mean, prone lying down, and they showed it on the oximeter. They showed on the oximeter that the oxygen level was... Uh, 80 uh, 80 percent and then they lie down prone and they did prone breathing and it became more than 95 so they would they would there are youtube videos on that so those were there then uh, besides the traditional ones people went also for the vitamin d and uh, you know uh, uh, the prescriptions of vitamin d vitamin c uh, which increased and foods containing vitamin d and vitamin c also increased so a, a number of untested herbs and uh, vegetables and fruits, which were uh, uh, propagated as uh, you know the you know, traditional uh, food items, and then of course the traditional methods, like I mentioned, mainly yoga and meditation and all types of exercise which people could do. 
uh, where they became, uh, I mean, I think, very, very popular during this time. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. Uh, you also answered part of the question of Dr. Andrea Furlan uh, about uh, there is, if there is any evidence that vitamin supplements can help in fatigue post COVID-19, and I would say also in pain. Uh, I don't know if yeah. you have to add something, Dr. Elena can comment also. Yeah, when you were mentioning about fatigue, we were talking about fatigue uh, as post-viral. But there are now many reports of fatigue by working from home, you know, and people uh, sitting on one chair and whole day and uh, the f fatigue because of webinars. This is the second one I'm attending in the last three hours. You know, so, <laughs> so, uh, fatigue because of uh, you know, too many uh, online activities and there are decreased outdoor activities. You know, we are not able to go out and all. So uh, th there are many other causes of fatigue. It's not only uh, the direct impact of inflammation and uh, immune system or uh, the prefrontal cortex or uh, things like those, but uh, also because of the lifestyle related changes. So the new lifestyle is uh, pro-fatigue. It causes more fatigue. You know? So that is another thing one should be very cautious about. But I think Dr. Elena might have some other thoughts. I agree. And interestingly, we are working also um, together or we collaborate also with our department of uh, um, um, pediatrics and one colleague sent me today an interesting paper in, from, also from Germany looking at um, adolescents um, of, uh, who were um, assessed um, about different symptoms and uh, comparing those who were positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2 and those who are not and a lot of symptoms uh, did not vary. So they discuss um, also, especially in adolescents, uh, where we have also post-COVID symptoms which are being reported, um, that it is not always only post-COVID um, syndrome, but partly also uh, post-lockdown um, syndrome, if one can say uh, like this, the psychological burden, which was, um, um, induced by it. Yeah. I don't know, uh, regarding your question about vitamin supplements, actually, I, as far as I know, the literature is quite um, conflicting, so I do not know whether there is a right or no uh, answer about it. Thank you, Dr. Lena and Dr. Santosh. I have a, a tricky question for you. If you could invest all, all your money or the money from your government in one or two aspects uh, to control the pandemic and to control pain in the pandemic, what would, uh, where would you, you invest? Well, you for, don't uh, because it's tricky, but it's. I know, I know. Uh, but, 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 thanks, so we, uh, but I, I hope you will also answer this question. <laughs> so I, I think I would invest in prevention of the infection, and uh, you know that can be controlled because uh, it, it is an infectious disease, and uh, it can be controlled. And for chronic pain, I think in the next time any, or even if this pandemic continues. Uh, the lockdown should be a little more modified so that people are able to do physical activity that will improve chronic pain. We know that the management of chronic pain is rehabilitation. And for chronic pain, you know, we need to do a whole lot of uh, physical activities and other things, uh, uh, you know, so one should invest uh, in uh, providing physical activities for people, uh, even if there is a lockdown or if they are get, getting any problems. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, pain management is very important. So in uh, prevention by vaccination or uh, by social methods and, uh, you know, management of pain. I completely agree. And I would also add maybe um, in terms of understanding the long COVID symptoms, 
trying to look for objective parameters to be able to differentiate between the psychological and the somatic uh, factors, and then probably or hopefully being able to prevent um, the development. Yes, I totally agree with you. I think this uh, this new era, health area, uh, will uh, make us to to highlight the importance of uh, our habits on health. Yes, and I think vaccination is very important also, but also. Uh, at least in Brazil, we only uh, hear about vaccination and vaccination and vaccination. And there are many other factors, especially psychological factors that are uh, as important as vac vaccination. I totally agree with you. So I think uh, we have five minutes more. We don't have uh, any uh, more answers. I don't know if you want to speak something more. Well, I, I think uh, uh, I fully agree with you that uh, this uh, pandemic has uh, raised our awareness towards our own health and mind. And uh, in India, we were very, I mean, I, I, I spoke in many uh, fora and in media that this pandemic reduced the stigma towards mental illness. People became more aware about mental health, even government became aware of mental health. And whereas people were, you know, considering it as very stigmatized, suddenly they uh, sat up and uh, there is fears and anxieties. These were as important as, uh, the, the, as the virus itself. So uh, it, it, I think for future, we should be prepared. And, uh, you know, uh, this one hit us out of the blue. Suddenly it happened and suddenly it uh, spread uh, like wildfire. And we didn't know what to do. And uh, but now I think, uh, and uh, we knew very little. And every time the uh, research findings are changing, some drugs were effective. Then they are not effective. The newer ones are effective. Now they are not effective. And then you know, uh, many things are changing. So we should be prepared for uncertainties in life, because life is going to remain uncertain. And we should be prepared as far as possible. So I think it was a very again, good discussion. Yeah. Again, resilience. <laughs> yes, resilience. Okay. So, so thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. Uh, and I hope uh, this effort will help patients to decrease their sufferings and to increase health across the globe. So it, was a, it was a pleasure to be with you and thank you very much. And I would like to thank you also, Dr. Baptista, for uh, coordinating this so well and having a very good discussion. Yeah. And to Dr. Elena, uh, your studies were very, very illuminating. And I think the participants, there were viewers who were there and they asked very good questions. Thank you. I also would like to thank to the ISP for the opportunity and also to to the attendees and also to you for the nice discussion. Thanks a lot. I would also like to thank IESP and also David and the team, Emily, who did everything so well. Uh, and, you know, made this, uh, this is one of the smooth, uh, smoothest webinars I have done without any technical problems and any other hiccups. Thank you. Yeah. IESP has uh, given us a very, very important uh, role. And I think also, to them and also to the uh, technical team. So see you in. Bye. Bye. Bye.